testifies over the FBI's investigation into Russian election meddling and that anti-Trump dossier. The complete transcript of the Senate Judiciary Committee's interview with the co-founder of the firm behind the dossier is now out. Senator Dianne Feinstein, the ranking Democrat on the committee, decided to release it despite objections from Republican Chairman Chuck Grassley. He says putting it out there only hurts the committee's probe. This is Outnumbered. I'm Sandra Smith, and here today, there she is, Harris Faulkner. The editor of townhall.com, Katie Pavlich, is here. Former deputy spokesperson for the State Department, Marie Harf. And joining us today on the couch, Fox News politics editor and editor of Halftime Report, Chris Starwalt here. And he is outnumbered, and you never know what you're going to get when Starwalt sits on the couch. Woo! It's going to be a good hour. Enthusiastic gratitude. Yes. Right. I will start with that. Enthusiastic <laughs> gratitude. Thank All you right. for having me. Daya is on fire. We Thank mentioned you. fire. Look forward to the hour. <laughs> Let's get it started. And in a unilateral move, this Senate Judiciary Committee's ranking Democrat, Dianne Feinstein, released the full transcript of her committee's interview with Glenn Simpson. He's the co-founder of Fusion GPS, the firm that was behind the anti-Trump dossier. Republican Committee Chairman Chuck Grassley saying while they will continue to work together, he's disappointed and that the release could hurt their investigation going forward. I think it does create some problems. For instance, when you're getting people to voluntarily come to you, it may make a lot of people a little more reserved about whether or not they want to cooperate. And I think particularly in regard to Jerry Kushner, that it could maybe affect our moving forward with that. Very high uh, profile person as an example. Uh, but uh, but it will will continue to move but forward. So is this Jared Kushner off the hook? No, no, not at all. And the president weighing in, tweeting the fact that sneaky Dianne Feinstein, who has on numerous occasions stated that collusion between Trump, Russia has not been found, would release testimony in such an underhanded and possibly illegal way, totally without authorization, is a disgrace. Chris Steyerwald, your thoughts on all of that? Well, because uh, <laughs> you guys were motioning over here. There was a lot happening. There, there was, was eyeballs. A lot, lot in there. Um, I did like that also in the tweet. Uh, uh, the tweet Trump called for a Democratic primary uh, of Dianne Feinstein <laughs> because you know California Democrats <laughs> snap right to it whenever the president right. calls. Um, <clears throat> the committee's work in this matter is substantially done. Um, this is the tremor at the end of what they did. And we should start out and we should say the Senate Judiciary, Chuck Grassley and Dianne Feinstein, as the ranking members on that committee, did a great job. And by the way, so did Senate Intel mm -hmm. um, in handling this. Uh, they were above board. They were collegial. They didn't get freaky. They didn't get weird. They didn't get excessively leaky. <laughs> mm -hmm. Neither freaky nor leaky. Um, <clears throat> and these are good things. Something that the uh, folks on the House can take a note about. Ooh. This is, at the end, Chuck Grassley earlier went ahead and recommended for prosecution Christopher Steele. Now, that was a slap at Dianne Feinstein mm -hmm. and Democrats. Mm. And what he recommended Christopher Steele for prosecution for was saying what they said was something different to them than he said to the FBI. So basically it was like, well, he's lying to one of us, so it must be you, and you should prosecute him. This is her response. This is my interpretation. Mm -hmm. She didn't say that. My interpretation is this is her saying, okay, you acted this way, so now I'm going to act this That's way. That's not very professional. Right, and this is what happens when you take a highly charged, highly sensitive, highly political matter right. such as this and put it in the hands of politicians. Even good, patriotic, seasoned ones like Chuck Grassley and Dianne Feinstein have a hard time keeping their sabers sheathed. Some are coming to her defense. One happens to be a Democrat. As Senator Whitehouse is defending Dianne Feinstein. Watch. What they've tried to do is to create this uh, sense that there's some collusion between the Russians and Christopher Steele, when you look at Glenn Simpson's testimony, it's clear that that could not be farther from the truth. And rather than just argue the point, I think uh, Senator Feinstein did the smart thing, which is just throw the whole transcript out there and let people see it. Marie Harvest in the background saying, uh-huh, uh -huh. I'm, I'm agreeing. Well, on this couch, we have so many times said we need more answers. They need to answer questions. We need more information. Here is a 300-plus page transcript.
of some of these answers that we've been looking for. So I think it's in the public's interest to see this. We can talk about the politics behind releasing it, and that's fine. But we've been looking for some of these answers, and it has been used in a very partisan way. And I do think that Fusion has the opportunity to defend themselves. They called on this to be released. So there was nothing untoward about it in terms of getting people to cooperate because the witness, in fact, wanted it to be out there. Well, they'll, they'll say they want it released, but they also won't testify in a public hearing. They refuse to well, do that. And Diane Feinstein now has given Glenn Simpson an out because he can now say, well, my transcript has already been published. Right, there's no, speaks right, there's no need for me to now testify in front of the American people and allow them to make their decision. In terms of the answers that we got from this transcript, there aren't many. Uh, Christopher Steele, or sorry, uh, Glenn Simpson refused to answer whether he was in touch with the FBI about this dossier using information. He refused to say whether he was employing Russian agents, people in Russia, to help gather this information. And he also refused to say and answer the question of, have you ever guaranteed a client that your research will prompt an FBI investigation of the person that you were trying to take down? So we actually don't have a lot of answers when it comes to the 300 pages that we got. And I think it opens the door to even more questioning of, of Democrats, the funding behind it, the Democrat National Committee, the Hillary Clinton campaign, and who exactly Christopher Steele is and who he was working with. Yeah, those were such excellent questions. It's a shame we didn't get some of those mm -hmm. answers. And, and I would say that for the other side, maybe the argument is, yeah, this has been released, but for the pertinent issues, we still want you to, to come and testify publicly. You know, I, I didn't lose the timing on this, did I, Chris? Mm. Because the president was just calling on Dianne Feinstein to ask her about immigration. I mean, that was epic, that meeting that we saw yesterday. That was something different. That was amazing seeing how those two sides, Republicans and Democrats, those invited to the White House, a hand-picked list, yeah. came and sat with the president and talked. He even, you know, at one point made sure that Dianne Feinstein had the floor at that totally. table. I'm calling on you. Come forth. And she said, well, I don't know if you would listen to this. We'll listen. Put it out there. And then this. I mean, I, I know that things don't happen simultaneously, but unfortunate, I would say. But it's still, as far as the president is concerned, he is still, as he did in this most recent tweet, is calling this the single greatest witch hunt in American history. He says it continues. There was no collusion. Everybody, including the Dems, <laughs> knows there was no collusion. And yet on and on it goes. Russia and the world is laughing at the stupidity they are witnessing. Republicans should finally take control. Well, they pressed that one guy to death with stones in Salem. So I think that guy would say that that was the biggest witch. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Literally. Literally. Uh, but you could actually do those things. Yes, they <laughs> Unfortunately. did. Unfortunately. Um, but um, <laughs> in, in this case, look, what they do in Congress matters less and less and less. We are down to recriminations. We are down to... Uh, scoring partisan points we are down to trying to get the last word in this is no no I said no I said no no I said that I released the last release yep. so we're down to that point and that's fine it's Congress we don't take them too seriously what matters now who's got the ball Mueller. Yep. Mueller's got right. the ball and everything now depends on when is Trump gonna sit down and yep. talk to Mueller what is the nature of that interview gonna be like how much of it's gonna be written how much of it's gonna be in person who else is gonna be called and the most important thing Chuck Grassley said going forward uh, the reporter said is Jared Kushner right. off the hook and he said not by a long uh, right, shot. Right right let's not let that get lost exactly. in all this. In meantime we've got another wrinkle in this dossier story President Trump's personal lawyer Michael Cohen filed a defamation suit over it. He's suing Fusion GPS, Glenn Simpson, and BuzzFeed, and tweeting this, quote, enough is enough of the fake Russian dossier, just filed a defamation uh, suit against, against BuzzFeed News for publishing the lie-filled document on POTUS and me. Katie? I think it's fair to say that the document is, is defamatory. However, I think this lawsuit is going nowhere. The president of the United States has been a public figure. He's now a public official, but he's been a public figure essentially his entire life. Uh, his attorney, Michael Cohen, is also a public figure, and the bar is very, very high for libel mm -hmm. and defamation suits. So they can win maybe on the, the PR here. They can make a statement about the intimidation and don't you know put, publish this stuff because we'll run you into court and, and rack up your legal fees. But in terms of actually winning the lawsuit, I don't think it's going to go very far. Yeah. I also am not sure that Team Trump wants to expose the full dossier to legal vetting because there are parts of it that potentially are true. Some of the most salacious stuff is probably not or possibly not. But if they want a judge to be able to go through every part of the dossier as yeah. part of a discovery process, I actually don't think that... Well, they could have unsealed it. Maybe they're confident Ultimately, that there's nothing there. Maybe they're fine I with think that. that is a false confidence. If you go through the entire dossier, there are many 
smart people in this field who believe at least some of it is true. Yeah, it, it's interesting what you say because I think when people look at the story, they have not definitively drawn a line between the president and his attorney. But this mm -hmm. is his attorney's lawsuit, and he has been a public figure, so to speak. Yeah. But not like a, a household name. Yeah, the most famous clip of the 2016 election. That's true. What polls? Which polls? Yeah. All of them. All of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Never forget. Never yeah, forget. Exactly. All right, we'll leave it there. Some of President Trump's biggest critics are rethinking their opposition after an extraordinary event at the White House yesterday when the president led a bipartisan and bicameral meeting of lawmakers with the cameras on. Plus, the two sides seeming to come closer to a solution on those so-called dreamers. But will the country get more border security in return? Back with this Fox News alert, the White House is responding to a federal judge's decision to temporarily block the president's push to end Obama-era protections for illegal immigrants who came to the United States as children, the so-called dreamers. The White House is calling this move by this judge outrageous. The judge's ruling coming after the president led a nearly hour-long bipartisan meeting on camera on immigration, and we got to see all of it. We are here today to advance bipartisan immigration reform that serves the needs of the American families, workers, and taxpayers. It should be a bill of love, and we can do that. But it also has to be a bill where we're able to secure our border. So in order to secure it, we need a wall. It has to be a bill to end chain migration. The other is to cancel the lottery program. They call it visa lottery. I really do believe Democrat and Republican, the people sitting around this table, want to get something done in good faith. And I think we're on our way to do it. The president said we'd have enough to chew on for about two weeks, and then he invited those reporters out. Democratic Senator Chris Coons believes the president may be able to push Congress to a deal. So what I thought we saw yesterday in that meeting, both in the visuals uh, and in the conversation, uh, was the president really trying to be and sound reasonable on a compromise around the dreamers on DACA? If the president mm. chooses to make this not just <clears throat> one day photo op, but to show real leadership here, he actually could move us forward by getting uh, a resolution to the status of dreamers and new investment in border security. All right, here's an update. A group of House conservatives led by Congressman Bob Goodlatte and backed by Speaker Paul Ryan is set to release their own immigration proposal today. It will reportedly call for aggressive border enforcement measures and a deal to help the Dreamers. Chief White House correspondent John Roberts is live for us on the North Lawn. John? Well, good afternoon to you, Harris. The uh, White House press pool right now in the cabinet room with the president where he's holding his first cabinet meeting of 2018. So it's likely that we will hear directly from the president on this issue of Judge William Alsup, a district judge, federal district judge in San Francisco last night ruling to block the rescission of the DACA program by the president. Clearly, he is not happy about it. Tweeting this morning, quote, it just shows everyone how broken and unfair our court system is when the opposing side of a case such as DACA always runs to the Ninth Circuit and almost always wins before being reversed by higher courts. Also is, as I pointed out, a district judge, but he falls within the jurisdiction of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. That's likely why uh, a lawsuit was filed in that particular jurisdiction. But what the president said was actually quite tame compared to what the press secretary, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, said about it this morning, where she said, quote, we find this decision to be outrageous, especially in light of the president's successful bipartisan meeting with House and Senate members at the White House on the same day. An issue of this magnitude must go through the normal legislative process. But in his ruling, and the judge may have been trying to tweak the president a little bit here, Judge Alsop actually quoted a tweet in which the president voiced his support for DACA, where the president wrote, quote, does anybody really want to throw out good, educated, and accomplished young people who have jobs, some serving in the military? Really? Well, the judge basically said, no, we don't want to do that, so I'm going to block your ruling. Now, all of this aside, including the White House IR, DHS Secretary Kirsten Nielsen said this morning she doesn't think that this court action is going to affect in any way uh, the efforts here at the White House and in Congress to reach a bipartisan agreement to fix the so-called Dreamers Act. Listen here. 
We are very disappointed by the decision, uh, but what we heard yesterday at the meeting was we're all committed to finding a deal. So a permanent solution is actually to the benefit of all the current DACA recipients, and that's what we'll pursue. So what we've heard since that meeting and during that meeting yesterday is that there does seem to be some momentum toward finding some kind of fix here. The question is what will be included in that fix? Uh, the president wants to fix DACA. He also wants some border security measures, including a wall and other items. And then he also wants an end to chain migration and an end to the visa lottery program. Yesterday, when he came out, the House Minority Whip Steny Hoyer said there was unanimity in the room about the need to address the issue of the Dreamers, but didn't say anything about border security. So <laughs> we'll see where this goes. And around and around we go. John Roberts, thank you. Thanks, Eric. So, Chris Steyerwalt. I don't know how big of a deal this is, you'll have to tell me, because, you know, January 19th will be here in a heartbeat. Lordy day. And the people in that room yesterday <laughs> seemed to think that they needed to get this done before next Friday. Well, there's, people say that, uh, that this is a must-pass resolution. Never underestimate Congress's ability to fail. <laughs> it is always within oh, their power. great. No, no, no. You mean to get anything done? Well, look, I'm, they... They're exhausted. They passed legislation, so they're very tired right they now. They had they all need, Christmas break. They need, to they need time to to, to recoup. <laughs> uh, the reality here is, the funding legislation that they need to pass on the 19th to keep the government funding. Now we got debt ceiling, military authorization. We kicking the. We have multiple can. We have cans tied together on a string, mm -hmm. kicking them down the street. <laughs> they have to address this on the 19th of January. Now, Democrats say they're not voting for it unless DACA is resolved. They right. won't vote for it. Now, I don't know that that's true. I don't know that that's 100% true. Uh. They say it. I don't know if it's true. On the other side, the Republicans say, we're not voting for any DACA amnesty unless we have a wall. Now, I don't know that that's true either. I think that I think we're finding out how much each side is bluffing about this, mm -hmm. and the appropriate thing is happening. The House is promulgating legislation. The Senate's going to promulgate legislation. And we'll see some of we'll that today in the happens. House. Well, yeah. and what was interesting, too, is you listened to that meeting yesterday. The president said, you know, I understand that there are parts of where you would, you yes. know, put a long yeah. fence line or a wall that will work, and there are parts which won't. We'll take a look at that. And it isn't that he hasn't probably known that all along, but now we're starting to hear even more detail well, about that. They move He's forward. also said that before yeah. as well. He, he, That's what I'm saying. It's right. not something that we didn't know before, mm -hmm. but now it's in more detail because they got to get a deal. Can I have an, a, an addendum to? Can I revise and extend my remarks? You can reclaim your time. I wish to reclaim my time, madam. Um, <laughs> and it's this: the most important thing that happened yesterday mm -hmm. in that meeting wasn't any wasn't any substantive discussion. Mm -hmm. But as Senator Kuhn said, and others said, after 10 days in which the discussion about Donald Trump was, is he too senile and stupid to be president? Uh, people said, oh, he seems to have a, bit, a, a, a command of these issues. He is conversant. He is uh, nimble. He is moving around the table. He is engaging people. He is, as you said before, bringing Democrats in, Republicans in. He was inhabiting the persona of a transpartisan dealmaker. Which is why they did it, probably. Well, yes, of course. <laughs> but and it worked, and it was 55 minutes of him being in command and him having command of you the know, issues. You know, speaking of which, the president's been holding his cabinet meeting today. We're about to get to that Ooh. now. Uh, but we are told that he talked about just that in this meeting, talking about how networks covered that meeting, said he received notes of congratulations from many people about We're his holding an hour long meeting. of that meeting from various <laughs> television back the um, networks. We do an hour of TV every but day. he does talk, guys, and this is important. Oh, Securing border, uh, the depleted military, talking about Moon Jae in. Uh, he said the phone call was very good. Nikki Haley was brief, but not on the call. Uh, the president's getting to a lot of very serious issues in this cabinet meeting. Let's listen. Welcome back to the studio. <laughs> nice to have you. <clears throat> Want to close that door when they're finished, please? Good morning and welcome to our first cabinet meeting of the new year. 2017 was a year of tremendous achievement, monumental achievement, actually. I don't think any administration has ever done, has done what we've done and what we've accomplished in its first year, which isn't quite finished yet. You never know what's going to happen over the next few days. And the achievements for our country, our people, and for our standing in the world have been very monumental. We confirmed an incredible new Supreme Court justice 
and more circuit court judges in our first year than any administration in the history of our country. And we have many more coming. We've set a new record on reducing regulation and all forms of stopping growth and stopping jobs that were crippling <coughs> America's economy. Again, the records that we set, 22 to 1, nobody's ever come close. And the amount of regulations that we've cut is a record also in our country's history, as reported by many newspapers, in particular, the Wall Street Journal did a big story on it. And before Christmas, we passed the largest tax cut and reform in American history, uh, including ANWR and including the fact that the individual mandate was terminated, which is a tremendously important thing and a very popular thing, I must tell you. People are supposed to pay for the privilege of not having health care. That was not good. Unfortunately, the courts didn't cut it, but we cut it. So, in addition to the largest tax cut and reform in history, we have one of the great oil sites that's now been approved. They've been trying to approve ANWR. I don't know if people know this. For over 40 years, Ronald Reagan tried to get it approved for exploration and for drilling. Uh, and for 40 years, they've been trying to get it approved. That was in the bill, an individual mandate in the bill. Since that tax cut was enacted, more than one million workers have already received a tax cut bonus, something that, frankly, nobody even thought about. We didn't think about it. Nobody thought about it. We just do a lot of good things were going to happen. And I must say, AT&T was at the first one, and they did it, $1,000 per employee. They have hundreds of thousands of employees. And many companies followed immediately thereafter, and now they're following I guess the employees are saying, what about us? And uh, millions of employees in this country are getting $1,000 and more, in some cases, tax bonuses because of the tax cuts. Hardworking American families will receive tremendous tax relief. We lowered our tax rates, nearly doubled the standard deduction, and doubled the child tax credit which Ivanka Trump was pushing very, very hard. I will tell you that. And so was Marco Rubio. And uh, I will tell you that the Republican Senate, we had no Democrat support, zero. They didn't want tax cuts. They want tax increases. They want to raise your taxes. They don't want to cut your taxes. But the child tax credit has become very important to the American family, and they're very happy about it. Our historic reductions to the business tax will raise annual household income by an average of $4,000. That's a tremendous number. The amount of money that's going to be brought in, we think it's going to be close to $4 trillion because of our tax reform, uh, will be a number that this country has never seen pour into our country. And that's going to create more jobs and more investment. The stock market is shattering one record after another. Unemployment is at a 17-year low. And I'm very proud of this. African-American unemployment reached its lowest level in history. Think of that. And on the campaign trail, remember, I said and would constantly say, what do you have to lose? Meaning, what do you have to lose if you vote for Trump? And now, it was just reported, African-American unemployment is at its lowest level in history. I'm very proud of that. We're also making America safe again. Yesterday, we had a bipartisan meeting with House members and senators on immigration reform, something they've been talking about for many, many years. But we brought him together in this room, and it was a tremendous meeting. Actually, it was reported as incredibly good. And my performance, if, you know, some of them called it a performance. I consider it work. But got great reviews by everybody other than two networks who were phenomenal for about two hours. <laughs> then after that, they were called by their bosses and say, oh, wait a minute. 
And unfortunately, a lot of those anchors sent us letters saying that was one of the greatest meetings they've ever witnessed. And they were great. For about two hours, they were phenomenal. And then they went a little bit south on us, but not that bad. It was fun. Uh, they probably wish they didn't send us those letters of congratulations, but it was good. I'm sure their ratings were fantastic. They always are. Which is why I think the media will ultimately support Trump in the end, because they're going to say, if, we, if Trump doesn't win in three years, they're all out of business. <laughs> you guys will be out of business, but the boom holders are still going to be there, so that's good. <laughs> those are the people I like. We agreed to pursue four major areas yesterday of reform, securing our border, including, of course, the wall, which has always been included, never changed, ending chain migration, canceling the visa lottery, and addressing the status of the DACA population. We want to see something happen with DACA. It's been spoken of for years. And children are now adults. In many cases, uh, the numbers are very different, very varying. A lot of people say 800,000. Some people said yesterday, first time I heard 650, I also heard 3 million. Fact is, our country was such a mess, nobody even knows what the numbers are. But we'll know what the numbers are. But above all else, any bill we passed must improve jobs, wages, and security for American citizens. The people who elected us, all of us, the people that elected us, we have to take care of them. We have to have a strong military. We can't play games with our military. Whether we're Democrat or whether we're Republican, we have to have a strong — that's not a point of negotiation. We can't say, oh, we're going to give you money for your military, but you have to give us money for something that, frankly, is much less important than security. And we have to keep our country strong. And our military was badly depleted over the last long period of time, beyond President Obama, I will say, beyond President Obama. Our military was very, very badly depleted. I just spoke to President Moon. He's very thankful for what we've done. They're having talks with North Korea. We'll see how that happens. Uh, he felt that the original, that the initial talk was extremely good, had a lot of good comment. Rex was on the phone, and Nikki's been totally briefed. But we had a very, very good conversation, and we'll see where it goes. He's very thankful for what we've done. It was so reported today uh, that we were the ones without our attitude. That would have never happened. Who knows where it leads? Hopefully, it'll lead to success for the world, not just for our country, but for the world. And we'll be seeing over the next number of weeks and months what happens. On a separate front, we are going to take a strong look at our country's libel laws so that when somebody says something that is false and defamatory about someone, that person will have meaningful recourse in our courts. If somebody says something that's totally false and knowingly false, that the person that has been abused, defamed, libeled, will have meaningful recourse. Our current libel laws are a sham and a disgrace and do not represent American values or American fairness. So we're going to take a strong look at that. Uh, we want fairness. Uh, you can't say things that are false, knowingly false, and uh, be able to smile as money pours into your bank account. We're going to take a very, very strong look at that. And I think uh, what the American people want to see is fairness. Finally, as we begin the new year, I want to thank my cabinet for working tirelessly on behalf of our country. Every single day, every hour, I'm on the phone with almost all of them all the time. And uh, we have a lot of exciting things to go. I'm just looking at Alex Costa. What a job you've done with our health care. Now, he's Secretary of Labor, but he's very much involved in health care. And I think uh, those rules and regulations will be out around February 1st, Alex, as I understand it. And this is health care through association. 
and associations. And I think that millions and millions and millions of people will be signing up. It'll be highly competitive. He has been able to totally get rid of state lines, so there'll be tremendous competition. And that will be a phase of health care that people don't talk about. But I think, ultimately, you'll have more people than you actually had, even in Obamacare. And it's just a segment of what we're doing. So I just want to tell you, I read a lot of those papers last night, and it is really great work, brilliant work. I think it is something that people don't talk about, but it's something that's going to be very exciting and very great. It will be great health care at a very competitive price. There will be tremendous competition, and it will cost the United States absolutely zero. So we're very proud of that. Thank you, Alex. And with that, I just uh, will start our Cabinet meeting, and we appreciate your being here. And you've gotten very familiar with this room. I appreciate your nice comments yesterday. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. The president not taking any questions or answering any questions there at the end on North Korea and the Russia, Russia investigation. What he did talk about there at his first cabinet meeting of the new year, he called it. He called 2017 a year of tremendous achievement. He talked about setting regulation or records by cutting regulations. He touted uh, tax reform and the effect that that's having on the economy and the low unemployment rate in this country. And he talked about the stock market and shattering records there. Often you hear that from the president. He did use this as an opportunity opportunity to tout that yet again. And he referenced back to that meeting yesterday we've been talking about, and he said it was a, a tremendous meeting, and he received notes of congratulations from various people. <laughs> he then moved on to immigration re reform and those libel laws. The president just wrapping up his uh, first cabinet meeting of 2018. Steve Bannon is stepping down from his post as executive chairman of the website Breitbart News. The move comes after backlash over remarks attributed to Steve Bannon and a new book. Maybe you heard about that. Meanwhile, The Washington Post is reporting Bannon told associates he plans to focus on creating a political operation in 2018. And he's banking on President Trump needing help from him again in the future, predicting that congressional Republicans will eventually desert the president. Mm. Will that happen, Chris? Well, it depends on how things go. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, one, of the, one of the challenges that Steve Bannon has, he views the world, he sees the world in these weird, large, historical swoops and sweeps. And he compares himself to one of the uh, courtiers for the House of Tudor, or he compares mm -hmm. himself wow. to you know, all of these grandiose things and all of this big stuff. Most of what happens in Washington, I wish people could understand this. This is my fervent prayer for my country. <laughs> <laughs> most okay. of what happens in Washington, most of what I cover, most of what we do is incremental mm -hmm. and annoying. Most of what happens happens in little meetings and it happens by accidents and then a little bill passes and then that doesn't happen and that, that confirmation doesn't go through. There are not the, it does not, you do not feel the thundering jets of history reverberating over the canyons of time. And Steve Bannon lives in this bizarro space. Maybe the president's going to need him later. Maybe he's not. But here's a good tip for you. Don't trash talk his children. Uh, and don't lose him back-to-back -back Senate races in right. Alabama. There's a good, there's a good starting, starting place. place. Yeah. So, you know, Katie, just looking forward, and no disrespect to the Democrat on the couch today. Oh, I but, love when sentences But, but that this is a gap Can't in time now, right? This is a gap in uh -huh. time. We know that after the presidential election, Democrats have still been trying to gather their message, so on and so forth. So this is a time for the party to do what with or without Steve Bannon? I think it's pretty clear that people are backing President Trump over Steve Bannon. And when you lose the Breitbart audience, if you go and look at the comments that were left on the website after uh, this blew up in Bannon's face, it's very clear which side people are on, and I'm not so sure that they're going to go back to Bannon as someone who's going to be the leader of the grassroots movement. Let's so not what forget. does that mean for the, for the party, though? If well, I don't know like what it means for we'll the party, see. but when it comes to... Bannon was supposed to be a grassroots activist kind of guy. He rode in on the Tea Party wave of 2010, mm -hmm. was heavily involved in the turnover of, of the House of Representatives, involved in Tea Party uh, movements all over the country. Um, 
I don't know if they're really going to take him back on this. It's going to take someone else to get in there and get that job done. Well, I think so you've got a president now who he doesn't need Steve Bannon, according to Katie and, and Chris. So what do you do in the meantime as Democrats? Well, we'll but we'll see in the Republican Party what, if any, role Steve Bannon plays in 2018. We have a Senate race in Arizona that has Kelly Ward, Joe Arpaio now, that has a lot of Bannon supporters and Trump supporters playing in that primary space. Will he play a role? Will it matter? You have the uh, Dean Heller primary that he has right. played a role in. Will it matter? We don't know the answers to these questions, but Donald Trump isn't on the ballot this, this November, and Republicans are. And Steve Bannon, a test for his staying power will be if he plays a role and if it matters, because so far this year he has a losing streak. Well, who else running. is going to play a role? I mean, Steve Bannon was not the only person who was we'll involved exactly. in we'll this see. movement that carried Republicans to power. There were a lot of other people involved at the gra grassroots level mm -hmm. and, quite frankly, at the establishment level. Yep. And when it comes to the record so far of the losses here, candidates are going to have to look at Steve Bannon's record and go, do I want to be another losing category yep. on his on his background? Sad All right. exclamation point. A surprising <laughs> take on politics by a New York Times columnist who admits He's no fan of the president. He's accusing the anti-Trump movement of, quote, getting dumber. Hmm. We'll talk about that. Oh, Chris likes that story. Columnist David Brooks explaining why he believes the anti Trump movement, quote, seems to be getting dumber and becoming less effective. Brooks writing, quote, the anti Trump movement seems to be settling into a smug fairy tale version of reality that fil filters out discordant information. More anti Trumpers seem to be telling themselves a madness of King George narrative. Trump is a semi literate madman surrounded by sycophants who are morally, intellectually, and psychologically inferior to people like us. Chris Steyerwald, the title of his column is The Decline of Anti-Trumpism, which he says suffers from low browism. Explain uh, what that means. Fire emoji, <laughs> fire emoji, fire emoji, fire emoji. Um, look, David Brooks is a hundred percent right because, and I would, to, we don't want to pretend like this is only a phenomenon of the anti-Trump left. Uh, this was, by the way, fair to point out, about the same point in Barack Obama's presidency that birtherism cropped up mm -hmm. and got real hot because part of it is this isn't happening. This just isn't happening. This can't be real. This guy's not really president. And remember, we started out with Trump, not my president, hashtag not my president. This isn't happening. And then he'll be unprecedented by the Russians. Uh, the, the Comey's going to make him unprecedented. Well, then maybe Mueller's going to make him unprecedented. And as they go through, now very much they bought into this wolf book, which is, uh, I don't want to call it trash, but it's a gossip book. It's a Kitty Kelly book. It's a hushed whispers in hallways at the White House, loosely sourced. This is supposed to be popcorn, not stake. Right. And they're clinging to this and they're clinging to these notions because they just don't want what's happening to be real. That's bad for them, but it's also bad for the country because it keeps them out of the kinds of discussions that you saw yesterday where you get them around the table and people can actually talk. Marie, what about that point, though? Because we have to come down to substance. And don't you think Americans tune out when it comes to just throwing up these accusations that may or may not be true, that are salacious and dramatic, rather than talking about policies which impact everyday people's lives? Well, I think we have to do both. And some of the accusations about President Trump's behavior, that he's erratic and emotional, those have been backed up by reporting from mainstream reporters and by his own behavior. But that's not enough for Democrats to run on. And I've said that every single time we talk about this. So you see Democratic candidates on the campaign trail who are not focusing necessarily on Donald Trump. They are focusing on a Democratic policy message. And you saw that yesterday with the folks that were at the White House. So you have to be able to do both. But I don't think we should discount everything in the Wolf book because 
he's not like the world's best. What about well, uh, go ahead, Eric, go ahead. I too thought this was an incredibly important piece, yeah. and obviously making it even more important and relevant is the fact that he is anti-Trump himself. But he talked about the insularity um, that the anti-Trump movement suffers from, and he goes into detail about most of the people who detest Trump don't know anybody who works with him or supports mm -hmm. him, right. and if they do have friends or family members who admire yeah. Trump, they've learned to not even talk about the subject, so they get most of their information about Trumpism from others who also detest Trumpism. Yeah. And I, and I think those are really relevant things that were relevant during the campaign, but he's kind of saying they're blossoming. It's in true the on both sides. I would, I, I would simply say misery loves company. And that's, <laughs> that's why you're seeing kind of the low brow attack. Low browism, as you said. Anyway, moving along, why conservatives and free speech advocates are very upset over a move to police the internet and reports that this effort is predominantly targeting one viewpoint. Guess which one? More outnumbered in just a moment. But first, let's touch base with Harris on what is coming up on Outnumbered Overtime just a few minutes away. Harris? All right, Sandra, thanks so much. What a lineup we have. Deputy White House Press Secretary Hogan Gidley on a federal judge blocking the president on DACA. House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy on immigration reform after that remarkable televised White House meeting yesterday. You saw it here live. Congressman Jim Jordan on Senator Dianne Feinstein releasing those transcripts of interviews with the co founder of the firm behind the anti Trump dossier. Could that compromise the investigation? And Senator Rand Paul will be on board on surveillance authority the president calls vital to protect us from terror. All that and more over time atop the hour. Sandra, back to you. We look forward to it. Harris, thank you. Well, new allegations that some in Silicon Valley are policing political views. Google is displaying so-called fact checks when users are searching for websites. According to the Daily Caller, the new tool is predominantly applied to conservative news sites. Prominent liberal sites do not get the same treatment. And big name publications like the New York Times are not fact checked at all. Here's a frame grab of the quote fact checked of the Daily Caller website. The report finds that Google's reviewed claims tool is partisan and inaccurate. In at least one case, the function suggests that a conservative site makes a claim that they actually never made. Chris, can we all agree at least that fact checking is a good thing? No. No? no. no. Okay, what? go for it. Fact checking is not journalism. Uh, Go on. So we have fallen into the trap of fact checking. Fact checking is just as subjective as any other kind of journalism. Okay. So if we're talking about in that case, anthropomorphogenic, did I say that right? I think you did. Uh, global warming, man made global warming, uh, how much of a factor it is, is actually a subject of some disagreement. There is no substantive disagreement that there is climate change. How much man's role goes into climate change is a matter of some dispute. When Google gets into saying, you're wronger than she is, or he's righter than you are, you're 70% wronger than she Google is way out of its lane. That's not the job. And, and I will just to make one more sniffy sniff about this, if I may <laughs> sniff. I am tired of these companies telling me that they're not content providers. I agree. I wholeheartedly I agree with you. I am sick and dadgum tired of Google and Facebook and all of these other people that are like, well, we're just a platform. We're just providing content that we police, right. that we say what's on it, that we say what it is. Well, hooey and horse feathers on that. Amen. That we disagree with. So, Katie, whose lane is it then? Because I think a lot of us look at the internet and think, I would like to know if things are true or not, right? I think it's up to the individual but person to do their own research on or a topic. Or the individual news organization. Right, or the individual yes. news organization. Well, the key here is that it's conservative organizations and news mm -hmm. outlets, conservative leaning, that are being targeted mm -hmm. here, which is always the case when it comes to fact checking or going after them like the IRS did. This isn't something that really ever happens to the left. We see it on college campuses and it's really just saying you're wrong because I disagree with you and it actually doesn't have a factual basis at all. So I'd be highly skeptical of the fact checking. So does Silicon Valley then, do they have a big problem then when it comes to bias? Well, yes, because, of course, we were talking about bubbles before. Right. And bubbles are, and there are very few bubbles in the world thicker than the one that surrounds and that more part insular. of the world. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and they live in that space. And, of course, uh, just as David.